religious leaders who were unwilling to praise the Lord. Only unwilling, they were not only unwilling to praise Jesus, they even tried to stop the children from doing so. And, you know, in life, we go through times where we might want to be unwilling to praise God. We might want to have a little hesitancy to, you know, we might be going through challenges and we might not want to praise God. But don't let the rocks cry out in worship in your place to praise God because he is worthy of it all. And um, I'm just so thankful that as we start this holy week, let's just, I just, um, during Church Wednesday, we watched this video of how much pain and suffering, you know, your whole life you hear how much he endured on that cross, but leading up to what he endured on that cross for us, and that's who we get to worship because he loved us so much. So like I said, don't let the rocks cry out in your place this morning. If you're going through anything, just lay it down and worship God this morning. And um, I wanted to read this prayer to y'all this morning. Um, I can find it. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer. It says, let me then give back into your hands all that you've given me rededicating to your service all I can do with my mind and body, all my possessions and all my influence with others. All these are yours to use as you want, Father. All these are yours, Christ Jesus. All these are yours, Holy Spirit. Oh, my Lord, speak in my words today. Thank you, my thoughts and work in all my actions. Thank you that it is your gracious will to make use of me, even at my weakest to fulfill your mighty purpose for the world. Let my life today be a channel through which at least a little of your love and compassion may reach the life of those around me. Thank you, Lord, that we come to church this morning to worship you, Lord. We thank you as we're about to start this holy week and Sunday we get to worship that you rose from that dead. But, Lord, we're not going to forget what you've done, the pain you endured for us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that we're not going to be like those religious people and not want to worship you. But this morning we're going to come and lay it all down and worship you, Lord, no matter what challenges we're facing this morning, Lord. We're not going to let the rocks cry out in our place, Lord, because we're going to lift it all up to you. We're going to raise a hallelujah this morning, Lord. So we ask where you're going to move in a mighty place this morning, Lord, that your presence is going to fill this room, Lord. We're going to walk out of here being touched by your presence, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we came to worship you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, McKenna. Let's stand and sing this morning. <clears throat> i uh-huh. 
praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
17 says, Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth, for his unfailing love for us is powerful. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. He is our way maker.
your never-ending, unfailing love and kindness and goodness, Jesus. You are so, so good to us, and we thank you, Jesus, for that knowledge today, that, that hope that we have in you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. Well, good morning, everybody. Good, morning. good to see everybody here this morning on this uh, beginning of Passion Week, Holy Week. Glad everybody's here this morning. Amen. Amen. I am uh, taking Miss Trudy's place here this morning. She's uh, feeling a little stuffy this morning, and she asked me if I would do this. And I checked again with her this morning just to be sure she didn't want to do it. She said, well, let's go ahead and do it today. So don't be afraid that Miss Trudy won't be back. We, we, uh, we want to pray for her. We sure do miss her when she's not here. She does an outstanding work up here in leading us in prayer. Amen. As well as our, uh, our ladies this morning, McKenna and Sarah and Stephanie, they always do a tremendous, tremendous job for us. Amen. Have a blessing to have them. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer in just a minute. After that, we're going to have a real brief uh, time of uh, sharing with fellowship with each other, you know, just kind of going around, meet and greet, and give you time to give your offerings as well. Um, we're blessed today that Tara and David opened up their home to us, and we're going to be able to go and have a time of uh, fun and food and maybe play some games and stuff. We appreciate them doing that. And so we're going to do that immediately after the service today. So I uh, hope everybody can come and be a part of that. Amen? Amen. Anybody have any prayer requests this morning? Yes, ma'am. Right okay. And I love everybody, but I'm not going to bring anybody. <laughs> <laughs> but I love okay. Stay All right. Stay okay. All right. Anyone else? No other prayer requests. Let's remember all those in uh, the path of those storms uh, this, these past few days. Of course, we had those took place in Arkansas yesterday, wasn't it? Or the day before yesterday, and then also uh, Mississippi the past few days. A lot of devastation in those areas. Let's remember all those affected by that. Uh, a lot of needs in our, our world today. Amen. Amen. Any other prayer requests before we go? No? Yes, ma'am. Amen. 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 All right. Anyone else? Okay. Well, let's all stand and, and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Well, we're so grateful, Lord, to have this privilege today to be able to come before your throne, to bring our needs before you. Lord, you know everything that we deal with or needs before we even bring them to you. But, Lord, your word invites us many places to bring our needs before you, Lord, to let you know these things that are heavy on our hearts for ourselves, for our family, for those that we know about that have uh, contacted us or maybe they just asked uh, a blanket ask of prayer. Lord, we, uh, we thank you so much for what you've done for us this past week. Thank you, Lord, for the ways that you've met our needs individually, the way that you've touched us, led us, delivered us, ministered to us, perhaps even healed us. We just give you the praise for that, Lord. Thank you for the help that we enjoy this morning, Lord, knowing our very breath is in your hands. We ask you, Lord, that you would touch these this morning that a little under the weather. Pray, Father, that you would minister to Miss Trudy, to, to Mom. I ask that you place your healing hand upon them. Lord, touch them in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that you, uh, that you love us in such a tremendously powerful way. Lord, that you are willing and able to meet every single need that we have. Lord, that you are God that hears and answers prayer. Lord, you are God that ministers to us. And Lord, you are, are those, you are the one that keeps us close to you, Lord. That minister to us, Lord. That, that spread your love abroad in our heart through your Holy Spirit. So grateful for that, Lord. Thank you so much for the ability to gather together this morning, other brothers and sisters, to be able to sing praises to your name, to lift up your name, Lord, to give you the glory that you certainly deserve. 
Thank you so much for those that have ministered to us this morning. Lord, pray for your blessings on them. Lord, we ask you to, to touch our, our country, Lord. It, many hurts in our country, in our world. The tremendous loss of life and the, the acts of terrorism. Lord, we pray for those communities, those families that suffered tremendous loss. Pray for those that have underwent the damages of the, the tornadoes. Pray, Father, for them. Ask you that you would minister to those families, that community, Lord. Pray for the, those that are trying to help, that you provide protection for them, Lord, in Christ's name. Those that are trying to bring relief, Lord, that they would be able to do so, Lord, that you would provide for all of those affected in Christ's name. Pray, Lord, that, that those that are in those areas that are able to minister to those that have lost, pray, God, that you would just bless them. I pray that this would be a great opportunity that the gospel message, the truth about Christ could get through when perhaps otherwise it couldn't. And pray, Lord, that they would have that, that benefit, Lord, and that blessing from you. And Lord, we just lift up uh, all of those that we know, our, our family members, extended family members, our co-workers, classmates, friends, associates, those that, that don't know you. We pray, God, for a call upon their heart. We know that no one can come unless, first of all, they are called by you, drawn by you. Lord, we pray for that in Jesus' name. Lord, pray that you would draw them to you, Lord, by the, by the working of the Holy Spirit in that life. Lord, that you would do that work in them and be so powerful that they wouldn't be able to resist. Lord, they'd be willing and obedient to, to give in to that drawing, Lord. Lord, before that drawing would go away, they would not come to a saving knowledge of you, Lord. We pray that not be the case. Lord, we know that your word tells us that you're not willing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. We pray that that will be done. Lord, I just pray that you'd bless our, our fellowship today, Lord, that you'd bless our meet and greet time. Thank you so much for the, for the giving of your people, Lord. I ask that you bless these tithes and offering. Lord, and bless the hands that give it. We ask it all in Christ's name. Everybody said amen. Hey, hey, good morning. How you doing? Good morning. What's up, brother? You doing all right? Good to see you, man. Hey, hey, hey. Flying solo today? Huh? Flying solo today? Where's the rest of it, man? Oh, my goodness. She worked on it. Yeah, she did. She did. What did that say? I do what I want. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see. What's up, brother? All right. You there? Girl, my mom. No, oh, she's sick and she's in on her back, too. Mm. 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 All right, tell him I missed her. You heard it. Good morning, how you doing? How are you? Hey, doll. Good morning. Good morning again. You did. I wasn't sure. She lost bouncy houses. I said, I hear you have a bouncy house for us. Good morning. Hey, Joe. You doing all right, man? Good, man. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right, brother. I'm good. Appreciate you, man. I'm ready. Good, good. That's good.
Everybody bring your Bible this morning. Everybody bring your Bible this morning. If you have it, I want you to do it right here. Share it with someone here that you know that's struggling. Open up to John chapter 12 this morning. John chapter 12. The message this morning is called From Palms to Passion. From Palms to Passion. John chapter 12, we're going to be looking this morning, starting with verse 1. I hope to make it down to verse 20, but I certainly hope we can. <laughs> Sound like some doubtful laughter there. <laughs> Amen. Let's have a word of prayer before we start. Amen. Father, thank you so much for this special day. Your special people, Lord, that we have come and we want to honor our Lord Jesus. Especially in this time of the year on our religious calendar that we, we honor His presentation as Messiah. And Lord, next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll be able to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, so as we examine this special week, the Passion Week, the Holy Week, pray that you'd bless us this morning, that you would enable us with our spiritual eyes to be focused this morning, to be attentive, and Lord, we'd be able to hear with our spiritual heart what you would say to us through your Spirit. Lord, I pray that you'd help me this morning in the teaching and preaching of this Word. Pray for your blessings on each one of us, Lord. Thank you so much for all that you do for us, and thank you for your blessed word. We ask all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen. We call this the Passion Week. Uh, it's also called Holy Week. Now, it's called the Passion Week because it's talking about the passion of Jesus Christ. Now, let me make a statement here. Don't think about what happened to Jesus Christ as a tragedy. Now, let me kind of define what I'm talking about there. What did happen to Jesus was tragic. Absolutely. The way they treated him, the way he was betrayed, uh, the way they punished him, the crucifixion, all was unspeakably tragic. But it's not a tragedy in the sense that it was unexpected, that it caught Jesus off guard, that it was somehow out of his plan, out of his purpose. We all need to understand, and I think most of you do, that Jesus came to die. Amen. And He came to die at a very specific time. And what is taking place in this Passion Week, in this Holy Week, is all according to God's plan. Amen. Jesus is not only a part of this plan, He is actually preempting this plan. He is pushing these things so that they will fall according to God's ordained timeline and in God's way. These people are acting according to their own free will, but unbeknownst to them, they are actually fulfilling prophecy along God's timeline. Amen. Jesus came to die. He came to die at an appointed time, in an appointed way, by an appointed people. And He is making sure and also pushing these things, prompting these things, so that they do happen according to God's plan and God's purpose. Amen. Now, during this week, this is going to be a very, very busy week for Jesus. Uh, it actually began, if we are looking at it on Sunday, we were actually trying to line ourselves up with the events that happening before the cross. Uh, if you and me are putting ourselves there on that Sunday, which we are here today on Sunday, the day before, Jesus has just uh, had a meal at a man by the name of Simon's house the night before. Simon was a person that Jesus had healed of leprosy. And he evidently had a house that was uh, able to accommodate Jesus and cook the meal for Jesus. Now, Jesus in, is in a place of Bethany. He's at the house of uh, friends that he loved, people that he spent much time with, people known, of course, as Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. These are very, very dear and close friends to the Lord. Jesus will spend the night at their home. Uh, he will go back and forth from Jerusalem to this place during the week, only about two miles away. So uh, keep that in mind as we're talking about that. Now, Jesus, we're going to be looking at in just a minute, is going to spend the night here. We're going to look at this in these first few verses in chapter 12. 
The next day, Monday, Jesus is going to get up. He and his disciples are going to make their way that two-mile trek into Jerusalem. On the way, he's going to curse the fig tree. When he gets into the city, he is going to cleanse the temple, the second cleansing of this temple. He cleansed it first early in his ministry. Here in the last week of his life, he is going to, by the cleansing of the temple, driving out the money changers, kicking people out of the temple, the Jewish temple, it is going to actually seal the fact that they have got to do something with Jesus. Keep in mind, they don't want to kill Jesus during this time. This is a time when he is tremendously popular, a time when we've got millions of Jews into this land for the celebration of Passover. They want to do it at a quieter time, whenever the crowds are not around. Again, Jesus is doing what? He's making sure that they do it. Amen? And so cleansing the temple that goes back to Bethany the next day, which would be a Tuesday, uh, they go by, they see the tree. Jesus teaches on that. He goes back in Jerusalem, does some more teaching there uh, in the temple area. Uh, Wednesday is kind of a silent day. Nothing that we know of uh, happens a whole lot, at least not by the biblical narration of it. Somewhere between Tuesday and Wednesday, Judas has made up his mind and already collaborating with the religious leaders to betray Jesus. Thursday, Jesus goes and he has the disciples prepare a place for them to have the Last Supper. Jesus takes his Passover a day earlier. Uh, normally, it would be observed on a Friday. Jesus takes it on Thursday. Why? Because Friday, he is going to be the Passover. <coughs> Amen? So he takes it a day early. That's also the time where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. He reveals to them, one of you is going to betray me. They are oblivious to know who it is. We know they don't. And then, of course, Friday, uh, excuse me, late Thursday night, Jesus is uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's praying. Temple uh, guards come out, apprehend Jesus. They put him through several illegal, three illegal mock trials where false evidence is presented against Jesus. The next morning, he's handed over to Pilate. You know, Pilate has him scourged, beaten, can find no fault with him, tries to have him released. He doesn't want to crucify him. The crowds beg for Barabbas in the place of Jesus. They say, Jesus, crucify him. They, they hand him over to the Romans. The Romans crucify him. Put him on the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning, Friday morning. 12 o'clock, the sky goes dark. Jesus is on that cross. And the last three hours on the cross is in darkness. 3 o'clock, Jesus gives up his spirit. And by the end of the day, before sundown, he's placed in the tomb there, a borrowed tomb on Friday evening. Saturday, a quiet day. Jesus' body is in the tomb. His spirit is down in the lower parts of the earth where we read about. Uh, Second Peter tells us about that, the events that take place there. And then, of course, Sunday morning, Sunday morning, a week from today, what happens early Sunday morning, the power and the Spirit of God go into that tomb, raise a dead Jesus to life. Amen. Amen. And he is alive today. Praise God. So a very, very busy week. Amen. I want you to go with me to, to chapter 12 and starting with verse 1. We're going to look at several different types of individuals, people, that are really a part of this story on this particular day. And I think if we're able to look in, into these different people that are there, and I believe, without a doubt, we're able to see ourselves in, in some of these people, okay, whoever it may be. I give, believe it gives a, a tremendous picture of not only the people that are there around Jesus, but also of people today. Amen? It says, then six days before the Passover, again, that would be the Friday that the Passover lambs would be slain. That was the day Jesus was on the cross. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead. And notice there's a comma, whom he had raised from the dead. Every time we see Lazarus' name, he's going to have that comma and that description about Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Now, this is important to realize. Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, perhaps a few days as much as just a few weeks prior to this. Now that's very important in the, in the understanding of what's taking place. The raising of Lazarus was the exclamation mark on Jesus' miracles, his ministry. Jesus in his three years of ministry had made food. Jesus had opened blind eyes. Jesus had uh, opened up deaf ears. He had straightened out withered hands. 
He had corrected feet that, that were lame. He had healed those of leprosy and incurable disease. He had drove out demons. He had uh, enacted his power, his authority over nature, quieting the winds and the waves. But the raising of Lazarus, you see, was the, again, the exclamation mark on the miracle. Now, Jesus had raised other people from the dead. The, the widow who was from Nain had a son. Jesus raised that child from the dead. Jairus, the daughter, Jesus raised from the dead. But Lazarus was a little different. Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. Amen. Lazarus had already been covered up in the grave clothes. They'd done seal the tomb, you remember? Four days. And in 2022, we'd done a, a couple of sermons there on raising of Lazarus, and you saw how the, his body was in a severe state of decomposure and rot by the time Jesus got there. And they were arguing when Jesus said, roll away the stone, don't, don't roll away the stone, he stinks. What stinks? The body, the decomp decomposition of that body. And so the raising of Lazarus, him coming out, kind of waddling out and having to be loose from those grave clothes was astounding. This went all throughout that known world, that area, that country. And the people come from all over to see not only Lazarus, who was alive, who they knew was dead, but also now that Jesus is here, guess what? The one who healed Jesus. So you got evidence. You've got a walking, talking miracle because everybody knew he was dead and in the grave, and now he's alive. We can go see him. We can actually talk to him. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. We can actually, you know, uh, get out there on our, our camel or get out there on the dirt road and walk and see him. And now that Jesus is in the area, guess what? All the people are coming. We're going to see here in a little bit that the, the people are actually leaving the temple services. They're leaving the, the religious system in Jerusalem to go and see uh, Lazarus and Jesus. They said the whole world is going out to him, the language they're going to use. This is what's taking place here. This is very important, very fresh on their mind. Jesus at this time is the most popular person in the area. He's like, uh, he's got this status that everybody wants to see him. People are, are talking about him. He is the most important person in that area, the most famous person in that area, and is drawing all the people to him. And this is by, by design. The raising of Lazarus was by design at this time to do what? To get the throng of people coming to him, to get the talk, the buzz, and the information coming to the people to do what? We've got to do something with Lazarus. We've got to do something with Jesus because this is messing up our system. Are you with me this morning? Well, this is where he's at. Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper. Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. We, don't, we, ever, we never see Lazarus saying anything. But he's, he's there. You know, We don't have a, any dialogue from him, but he's there. And Jesus loved Lazarus. Do you remember when he came to the tomb... Jesus wept. He had these bitter tears. He wept there. Even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, he understood that. He knew that. The, the heartbreak that he had because this was someone that he loved. He loved Lazarus. And the loss of him and the feelings that was there with those sisters and those that incurred that loss, it, it broke Jesus deep down inside. That he loved Lazarus. Lazarus is there. There's Mary and Martha. Now, we've got this account, by the way, this uh, this coming into Jerusalem in all four gospel accounts, okay? Matthew covers it, Luke covers it, Mark covers it, and of course here we are in John. And so we kind of need a conglomerate of all four gospel accounts to get a perfect view of this, at least as best as we can. Are you with me? Okay. What we're looking at is Luke. I'm going to be pulling as we talk from these other accounts and so we get a kind of a full picture of it this morning. Amen? Okay. Now, you know, Martha, Martha, in other accounts, what was she doing? She had the gift of service, right? She was a worker. And she was there busy cleaning and cooking. And, you know, she complained to Jesus, you know, tell Mary to help me. Uh, you know, she was doing what she was blessed to do, which is what? Service. And she was doing it for the Lord. Now, she wanted some help. Uh, a lot of us couldn't fault her for that, right? Amen. Lazarus is not doing anything. He's just there, right? just absorbing the, the fact that Jesus is there, and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now notice what Mary does. This is important. 
Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Now from the other accounts, we know this is a, a very costly perfume oil, spikenard. This would have come from the Himalayas. It would have been brought in, imported through camels. Very costly because it cost a year's wages. We're talking about something in a Jewish set of reckoning, anything from 12 to 16 ounces would be considered a pound. This is what we've got. We've got a flask of this very costly, very rare spikenard. It is a herb that the essence and the scent of it can be captured in oil. And in those days when you did not have embalming, it was something that was very important to have as they would cover and try to perfume the, the scent of the loved ones that had passed away. Are you with me? Yes? Okay. And what does she do? Think about it again. This cost a year's wages. I want you guys to think, at least listen to me this morning on this. What do you make in a year? Now I want you to put that in one box, one little thing of perfume, okay? One thing of oil. Have you got that picture in your mind, okay? Everybody, yes? She, she takes this flask and pours it all over. The other gospel account says from head to toe. All over the body of Jesus. And then something that is very unusual because a woman of prominence would not have undone her hair like that. She undoes her hair and begins to wipe off that very expensive perfume off of the body of the Lord with her hair. As you can imagine, the aroma diffused throughout the entire room. And the whole room was filled with the aroma that spiked her. A very beautiful sacrifice, would you agree? Yeah. A year's wages is not something to, you know, we're not talking about a couple of hours wages, okay? Some of y'all would be very significant. Amen? Yeah. A year's wage. And it, it's put on there. Now what happens, if you look at this, one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, So what did he say? Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii? That's the common uh, year's wages in that time. For 300 denarii and given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. Now what do we see here? We've got a tremendous contrast between the love of Mary and this despicable hatred of Judas. Can you see that? Here's one Mary who doesn't think anything is too great for her Lord. A year's wages. Again, don't let that escape, okay? And we're not talking about your, your $50 thing of, of oil at home, okay? If you make... 30,000, if you make 75, you make 100, if you make more than that, think about that, and then giving that to the Lord to anoint the body. Jesus recognized, he says, what she's done, she's anointed my body for burial. Everybody with me this morning? But Judas, what is Judas? Judas, in his hatred of what she's done, he is just enthralled by this. And he said, what a waste. What a waste. And he says an alternative, he suggested, we should have taken this oil that's worth 300 denarii, a year's worth of wages, sold it, and then taken the 300 denarii and given it to the poor. Now there's nothing wrong with giving to the poor. The problem is, that's not what Judas was about. Amen. Why? Because it tells us that Judas was a thief. Now keep in mind, Jesus had a ministry, a very public ministry. Three and a half years of ministry, and there were people that Jesus would go, and they would contribute to Jesus' ministry. They would be giving to Him. And guess what? They had a treasurer there. They had somebody there that would keep a, a, uh, uh, the, the book, the pocket book for the Lord's ministry. And guess who that was? That was Judas. And Judas was doing something with that money. What was he doing? He was pilfering. Judas was taking. He was stealing out of the resources that the people were giving to that. Judas had no, no intention of taking this and putting the money toward the poor. Judas had in mind what? Oh, I could have gotten a piece of that. I could, we could have got 300 denarii, and he's been taking it out all this time and nobody's noticed. And now I've missed it. What a waste. What a waste. You see, here's the contrast between the one that says there's nothing too good for the Lord 
Nothing that, it, that I have that cannot be too great a sacrifice for me to give to my Lord because I love Him so much. That's Mary. Amen. And then there's Judas that said, this is such a waste. Such a waste. I can't believe somebody would give that and put this on the Lord. Maybe you know people like that. You maybe know people on both extremes. You know people that, that love the Lord, and man, they'd give everything they could to the Lord. And you also per perhaps know people on the other side that would say, man, I would not give anything. That's a waste. I had a, 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 a gentleman in my office this week. Uh, in, his, in his job description, he actually handles a lot of funds for uh, families. Whenever a, a, a person who has an account with him uh, passes on whenever they die. He's one that actually is in charge of distributing the funds to the family members according to the will. Follow me? Well, as he's talking to me, telling me uh, this week, he was telling me about some significant funds. He didn't tell me an amount. I assume it was very significant. That uh, the, the mother had passed, and according to the will, he goes and he's distributing now the money from the will to the heirs. And I'm assuming there was at least a couple of heirs, children. Well, he breaks the news to them because uh, evidently the, the, uh, the mother did not. He breaks the news to them that 15% of that is going to the church. And the remaining 85 is split between the two. Guess what? They were irate. I can't believe they're gonna, you're going to give that to the church? 15%? It ought to go to us. What a waste. And he asked him the question. I'm, I'm just, you know, taking all this in. Well, did, did your mother, was she a faithful attender of that church? Yeah, all of her life. Did your mother tithe to that church? Yeah, all her life. And yet, what, is it, what do we see? We see the tremendous hatred of that. The hatred of that. I can't believe that. I can't believe she would do something so, so bad, so evil. Some people view that in the things that we give to the Lord, the things that, that we freely give or the things that we feel like we're, we should give or whatever. I'm not going to do that. That's a waste. That's a waste. We see that tremendously portrayed here between Mary and Judas and the two hearts that are behind the two. Amen? Amen? If you look at what Jesus said, He says, let, let her alone, talking about Mary, she has kept this for the day of my burial. He understands what she's doing. He tells us, For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Amen. Again, he's not, he's not trying to condemn giving to the poor, but he's trying to let us know that, hey, no matter what you give, you're going to still have the poor. You cannot eradicate poverty. You cannot erase it. The thing that can be erased is the very presence of Jesus. And he's saying, no, I'm, you know, it's just a few days. I'm not going to be here always. You're going to always have the poor, but not always going to have me. Amen. Now look at verse, if you will, with me, verse 9. Now a great many Jews knew that he was there. And they came. Not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus. And then here's that statement again, the comma, whom he had raised from the dead. Is everybody with me? Yes? Okay. But the chief priest plotted to put Lazarus to death. Also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So now we're giving, we're being able to see the problem that's arising in Jerusalem. What's going to prompt them to act when they don't want to act? The other gospel accounts, Matthew and others tell us they did not want to do this during Passover. But what's happening? Well, now we've got to do something. We've got to do some hiding of the evidence, right? Okay. You've heard of tampering with evidence. You've heard of destroying evidence. Well, guess what? Here's Lazarus. He's the evidence. We've got to do something with him, right? We need to remove him. We need to kill him. Jesus is raised him from the dead. Let's kill Lazarus. That way we won't have anybody they can go and see and they can go and talk to. Amen? How evil are these people? Are you following me? And by the way, these are the religious zealots. These are the ones who are in charge in Jerusalem. Okay? These, these are the priests. These are the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. So they're plotted to do what? To, to kill Lazarus and they will come to killing Jesus. Why? Because they're seeing their crowds diminish. Their people now are no longer coming to the temple services. Where are they going? They're going out to see Jesus. But again, keep in mind, this is all part of the plan. 
All to do what? To incite them, to get them to act. The drawing of the people. He's there in Bethany. We've got scores of people coming. You may say, well, how many people are we talking about, Rick? Well, we have an ancient census from around that time that tells us how many Passover lambs were killed on that Passover. Are you ready? This census tells us 250,500 Passover lambs were sacrificed in that year. Did you hear that number? 250,500 Passover lambs were sacrificed according to this ancient uh, recovered census that we have. Now, a Passover lamb was sacrificed one per family. And the family, the households were probably much larger than our households are today, around probably 10 people. 10 people per household, one lamb. If you take that, do the math, we're talking about probably a number somewhere around two and a half million people there in Jerusalem. You see, their feast, this was one of those feasts which they had to be there. There were seven feasts, yearly feasts, but there was three of them that, that God had commanded compulsory for them. That was the Feast of Passover, this one. There was the Feast of Pentecost, 50 days from now. And then about a half a year later, the Feast of Tabernacles. So now you've got people from all around the known world that are Jewish, from North Africa, from up in the area north of them, in the area of Galilee, perhaps some up in the area of Syria, Damascus, all those areas that are converging now, as many as two and a half million people in this one little place. And guess what? There are, there are hundreds of thousands of them that are leaving and going to Bethany. Is everybody with me? And so this is not, we're not talking about five or ten. We're talking about hordes of trains of people, parades of people that are going out. And the people that are in the know, that are in the places of power, are taking notice. The next day, verse 10, I'm sorry, verse, uh, verse 12. The next day a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took branches of palm trees, and they went out to meet Him, and they cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Then Jesus, when He had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now here what we have, we have the, the going and the coming. The going and the coming. We got people that are, that are coming to see Jesus, okay? They're coming from all different areas. They're coming from Bethany. There are people, there's a crowd there. And there's a crowd that's coming from Jerusalem to meet Jesus. Can you imagine this? They're going to they're gonna kind of coalesce in, in this setting here with the triumphal entry, Okay? Keep that in mind. Like two waves coming together. There's a wave of people that's in Bethany already. They're, they've already been there. They've known uh, about uh, this man has been raised from the dead. They know that Jesus is there. They're there talking and being with him as he's ministering. And there's those that are coming to Jerusalem. They're hearing the news. They're wanting to know where he's at. They find out. And so they're coming. So all of these hundreds of thousands of people are about to meet there. And what do we see? We see Jesus now leaving Bethany and then going to Jerusalem. He's about to make this very, very important triumphal entry, proclaiming himself, uh, showing himself to be the long-awaited Messiah. Now we've got, again, other accounts from different Gospels. What John leaves out, I need to tell you about, you've heard it before, you know it, that Jesus, as he's about to go into Jerusalem, again, two miles away, he's leaving Bethany, he goes up his slight little slope, which is called the Mount of Olives. You've probably heard that. The Mount of Olives, if you were standing in Jerusalem looking out the eastern gates, you could see the Mount of Olives there. Okay, In between you and the Mount of Olives was this little place called the Kidron Valley. The Kidron Valley, just like it says, a little valley. Now one remarkable thing about the Kidron Valley, as they were on the high ground in Jerusalem, and everything that would leave there would flow downward down into the valley, one thing that is remarkable about that, you would be able to see the blood coming from the Passover lambs feeding into the Kidron Valley. If it was a time of morning sacrifice, they would always, every single day, they would sacrifice a lamb. In the evening, every single day, they'd sacrifice the lambs. You would be able to see that trickle of blood. But can you imagine 250,000 being sacrificed on Passover? That now would be a, a mighty big stream, would you imagine? So as you're crossing the Kidron Valley, you'd be able to see the, the blood trickling down from the altar coming from the temple area. Not on this day, but in a few days you will, on Passover Friday. 
But as you would come up that, you would be able to see the top of that uh, Mount of Olives. This is where Jesus is at. And he tells the, the two of his disciples, he says, I want you to go to this place. He tells them a place, and you're going to find a post there. On that post, you're going to find a couple of donkeys tied there. Matthew tells us there's two donkeys there. Again, we've got to put all the pictures together. He says, I want you to go to this place, two disciples. Uh, evidently, they didn't know who it was. He said, you're going to find uh, donkeys there, tied there to a post. I want you to loose those donkeys and bring them to me. And if anybody asks, he gives them a very cryptic phrase, right? You remember what it was? Tell them, the Lord has need of it. Anybody in here like for people that you don't know to come on your property and look around? Okay. I had that this week too. I had a lot of things happen this week. I had to go to the, go to the house for something, leave work. Went over there and I noticed as I was leaving, I saw a car going by really, really, really slow. Always raises suspicions, right? And so I follow them. They turn off. I keep on going. I turn in. They don't know I've turned in. They back up and they go back. They pull in the driveway. Well, now I've got to do something, right? They go back and I say, hey, can I help you? Oh, I'm just looking at, looking at this car or whatever. Okay. Here are these disciples. You understand what I'm talking about, right? Somebody pulls into your, your driveway, your home, you're going to be suspicious too, right? Here's the disciples. They come up and they, they find the colts tied there. They begin to untie them. So naturally, somebody's going to say something, right? And they say, what are you doing? And here's the code phrase. The Lord has need of them. And they're like, okay. Okay. Now what does that imply? It implies this. They knew Jesus. Are you with me this morning? They knew Jesus. All they had to say was the Lord had need. Well, they obviously attributed the Lord with Jesus. And so, hey, Jesus has got need of it. Sure, take him on. Take both of them. We've got what? We've got the mother donkey, and then we've got the, the one, the unbroken colt, the, the baby donkey, if you will. And they're going to be both brought to Jesus. But it's astounding. It's amazing to me that we see that here are these people. They're alarmed first. What are you doing? Are you stealing our, our, you know, our donkeys? No, the Lord's got need. Okay. They knew Jesus. They understood Jesus. Here's the problem that I, that I find with that. that I'm, just, you know, I'm looking at Scripture and I'm asking questions and I'm, I'm trying to answer those questions. They knew Jesus and they were willing to give Jesus, but why were they a mile or so away? Why were they not with Jesus? My suggestion is this, guys. This is one of the more important times in the ministry of Jesus. The birth is important, yes. The baptism, important, yes. Right? Transfiguration, important. Uh, the crucifixion, of course, important, yes. The resurrection, yes, yes, yes. Very, very, very important. I'm going to put this, the triumphal entry, alongside of those, somewhere behind those, okay? But very important. Why is it that we've got hundreds of thousands of people coalescing there in this point, and these are people that know Jesus, and they're what? They're, they're at home. Dad said, well, they got, somebody got to watch the donkeys. I guess so. I guess so. Why, why is it that they're, they're there, they know Jesus, and yet they're not with Jesus? Amen? Amen? Yes. Are you listening to me this morning? And so those, are the, those that are sent, they're disciples of Jesus. They're going to get the donkey, and they, they don't come along. They don't say, well, oh, I didn't know Jesus was there. We'll come with you. Right. They just said, okay, you can take it. I think it's a powerful lesson yes. there. Amen. Amen? But the going and the coming. Now, what is the significance of that? Whenever they bring the donkeys to Jesus, Jesus, of course, decides to take the one that's unbroken, the, the baby donkey, if you will, no one's ever rode it, and to get on that donkey and to ride that donkey into Jerusalem. Now, what's the significance of that? Now, understand this. In that, that era, 2,000 years ago, uh, a Roman conqueror would come into a city either on a horse or on a donkey. And the animal that he chose to ride conveyed what his intentions was. Now, if he chose, if this Roman conqueror, this Roman general, chose to bring himself in on a stallion, a white horse, it meant war. I'm coming in war. You, you would have no doubt about what his intentions are. I'm coming to conquer you. I'm coming to wipe you out. I'm coming in war to battle. But if that Roman general came riding on a donkey, guess what? It didn't convey war. It conveyed peace. I'm coming in peace. 
So he can come in what? He can come in war or he can come in peace. All depending on what? The sign he gives you by what he's writing. Here is Jesus, the king of the Jews. He's not coming on a white horse. He's coming on a donkey. Not just a donkey, but the little foal of a donkey that has never even been broken. What is he doing? He is showing his tremendous humility in the week that is to come. The sacrifice that is to come. Are you with me? Amen? He's not coming to declare war. He's not coming to wipe out the Romans. He's coming to give a show of peace. There is a prince of peace in his humility presenting himself to Israel as her long-awaited Messiah. You say, well, what are you talking about there, Rick? Well, I want you to take your Bible and I want you to show you, I want to show you, rather, <coughs> Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. So go back. Find your last Old Testament book, Malachi, and then go back one more book, and you'll find Zechariah. Now, Zechariah, Zechariah's living in a time uh, roughly 500 or so years before Christ. And he's a prophet, Zechariah is. Now, what's a prophet? A prophet, an Old Testament prophet, had two functions. They, they would speak forth the Word of God, that was one of the functions, or they would actually uh, speak the Word of God. Now, what are we talking about there? We're talking about actually taking the Bible and reading it. That's just speaking the Word of God. Or they would speak forth the Word. Prophecy. Prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy where God foretells the future. Now, for me and you today, we look back on this event. It's ancient history for us, isn't it? 2,000 years. In Zechariah's day, when he spoke this, what's he doing? He's looking with binoculars, telescope, way out into the future. And he's foretelling something that's going to take place. We call that prophecy. It's God foretelling something before it ever happens. It's God putting history and writing it in advance. Now, I'm not talking about vague prophecies. I could give you a vague prophecy. I could say, hey, somebody in here is going to have a bellyache next week. That's, that's kind of vague. What are the chances of that happening? Okay, somebody had, oh, that, that was prophetic. No, no. That's just what? That's just luck, which there is no such thing, right? We can't do prophecy. Why? Because only God knows the end from the beginning. None of your holy books that are out there in this world, the world's holy books, do not go into prophecy because they can't do what? They can't foresee or tell the future. I could tell you, hey, there's going to be uh, financial trouble next year. That's pretty vague. I guarantee you could find some event next year after it takes place. You could say, oh, yeah, that was right. That's how we kind of view man's prophecy, not God's. God's is exact. Amen. God's is exact. Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. Look at it with me. Zechariah 9 and verse 9. Does everybody have it? Yes? Zechariah 9 and 9. Zechariah, of course, writing again before the Lord hundreds of years. Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem, behold, your king is coming to you. Who? To Jerusalem. He is just and having what? Salvation. Meaning what? He's coming to save. He's got salvation. He, he's there to save. To save what? To save you. To save those people. And notice this. Lowly and riding on a what? A white stallion? What? A donkey. But notice the details, guys. A colt. A foal of a donkey. How precise are we getting? We're getting so precise. He said, your king's coming to you, and this is how he's going to come. He's going to come riding a donkey. Not just any donkey, but the, the baby donkey, the foal donkey. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay. Now, there's one other thing I want to show you very, very quickly, and that's in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. The last four verses of Daniel chapter 9. Very, very, very important prophecy. One of the most important prophecies in the Bible. Again, prophecies is God telling the future in advance. Daniel, in this time, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel's an old man. This is not the, the young Daniel that's thrown in the lion's den, okay? Same Daniel, but a lot of years have passed. Daniel's an old man here in Daniel 9. He's been in, in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. So he's getting to go up there. Amen? 
And he realizes something. He'd been reading the Scriptures. He'd been studying the Word. And the Word has prophesied in the past, in Daniel's time, that they were going to spend 70 years in that captivity. Guess what? That 70 years is up. Daniel has read the prophecy. He understood what God said. He's been counting the years. Guess what? God said 70 years. We've been in captivity 70 years. It's about time for us to be released. And so what does Daniel do? He begins to pray. He's praying this, that he knows it's time to be released. God prophesied it. 70 years is up. And God sends an answer to Daniel through an angelic messenger named Gabriel. And he gives us this famous 70-week prophecy, one of the most famous, if not the famous, uh, time prophecy, prophecy of time, in the entire Bible. Daniel 70 weeks. We've talked about it many times throughout the years. I want to give it to you very briefly. I've only got just a few minutes. Everybody ready, yes? I want you to see. He tells him in verse 26, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And he then tells him, I'm going to get six things that they're going to do. Number one, to finish transgression. Number two, to make an end of sin. Number three, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Now there's a, there's a break there because three of them Jesus is going to fulfill in the passage that we're looking at. The next three, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Those have yet to take place. Now, 70 weeks. Jewish people, the Jewish uh, way of reckoning, they had a week of days like we have. Seven days is what? One week. We understand that. They had that too. The Jewish people, people also had a week of months. Seven months will make a week of months for them. We don't have that. That's foreign to us. Not for them. They also had a week of years. Seven years makes a week of years. Seven years. This is what he's talking about. So 77, 70 weeks of years. Seven times 70 is 490. So what he's doing, Gabriel, the angel from the Lord, is giving Daniel a mathematical, because it's got numbers in it, prophecy of what? Daniel, I'm giving you and your people, the Jewish people, 77s. 490 years to do what? To accomplish everything. At the end of the 490 years, it's all wrapped up. It's all done. All completed. Everybody with me so far? I want you to look at it with me. He breaks it down into several parts there. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth, this is the beginning of it, from the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome time. Now keep in mind, that during this time that Daniel's getting this, Jerusalem is in waste. They've already been destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar has destroyed it all. The temple, the city, the walls, is all in waste. It's all in ruins. He's letting him know it's going to be rebuilt. And he's giving him the timeline. He said, after the 7 and the 62. Now what's 7 and 62? 69, right? So he's saying in 69 weeks of years, which is actually 483 years, Messiah is going to come. Now, when's the starting point for that? Well, he tells him. From the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, we know from an archaeological fact that a guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes gave the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. What's even better than that? We know the exact date that he gave it. March 14th, 445 B.C., before Christ. That's when he gave an official legal edict 